This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast for the 18th of June, 2019. And here's my co-host, Going With The Flow, <laughs> Going With The Flow to Hawaii, if I understand things correctly. That's right, that's right. <laughs> We're all about going to Hawaii to learn about ML Flow. Yes, well, don't, don't worry, dear listener, we're not going away Spoiler anywhere. Right. It's uh, <laughs> it's just wishful thinking at this point, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, possibly, yes. Yeah. But uh, we've got an interview this time with a, uh, a guest who is all about things uh, concerning model management, machine learning, operationalization, and things like that. Uh, we found Alex from a talk he did at DataWorks Summit in Washington, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. Well, uh, we, we, we found him a long time ago. He's ah. been a, an ex-colleague, worked with us previously. <laughs> but yeah, more recently, he's done a, a He a popped up, session. let's call it that. Yeah, he did, he did. And uh, he's done a recent session on uh, ML Ops, which mm-hmm. is a term he's, uh, he's coining, which I quite like. Everything <laughs> should be Ops. Um, oh and uh, so we we're, we're talking about him with uh, ML flow and ML ops and how to adopt it and why it's interesting and why you should care and all of that wonderful stuff. Yeah, he's a real smart guy. I've been trying to get him on the podcast for ages, and uh, that's why I started with the DataWorks Summit talk. When he did that, I knew I got him. I knew I could grab him and drag him in, and now he is a victim of the Roaring Elephant podcast. <laughs> that's something there i is, can say <laughs> there, is a, there is a support group out there it's called our patreons <laughs> yes <laughs> anyway more on that later but uh, i think unless you've got anything else we nope. can uh, jump Let's straight to it. it so we're joined today by a special guest alex zeltoff welcome good to see you again thank you thank you good to see you guys here from you guys i'm amazed you guys can see each other i know yeah, we're yeah, on youtube yeah. We're we're <laughs> yeah yeah no we're, we're communicating through the ether uh we're, we're just plugged into the matrix here um so it, it's been a while but uh you're now at uh, at microsoft and part of their big data and advanced analytics team so tell us tell us a little bit about that what what do you get up to on a daily basis oh <laughs> So, yes, you are correct. I'm part of uh, what they call the Global Black Belt team, which uh, our team concentrates on big data and advanced analytics. Uh, So predominantly, uh, I'm still deeply involved with the big data stack, uh, concentrating on the Hadoop, HD Insight, Databricks, uh, and also from the advanced analytics, uh, the Azure Machine Learning Services, and now part of the new kind of offering is also uh, MLflow is uh, also one of the integration points that we're integrating. Uh, as part of my role, I'm more uh, responsible for the what we call AI engineering mm-hmm. Um some of it will call it ML ops. So for making an end-to-end pipeline work. So we're for a lot of my team actually comes from Revolution R for background and pure mm-hmm. data scientists, PhDs. Uh, they for typically a lot of them just concentrate as most of the data scientists, just kind of delivering on the uh, machine learning model building aspects. Uh, I try to take a look at the whole end-to-end kind of a life cycle beginning from the data ingestion, model building, versioning, kind of a putting in the engineering aspect to it. And that's partly probably because of my 10 plus years of software engineering background and uh, delivering kind of uh, production ready systems. So uh, I think that that's deeply embedded into me. So uh, 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 that's where I am right now. Nice, nice. And uh, we've had kind of, data ops uh, discussions on here recently and now we're continuing with kind of ml ops that seems like everybody's everybody's in the ops world nowadays that's right the, uh, the talk by christopher berg was very good so if uh, the audience hasn't heard the previous two podcasts uh, definitely check out christopher berg's on data ops so i think I, I would treat this as a continuation of that so you have your dev ops yeah. you have your data ops and uh, ML ops is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's an official term, but let's apply to it. Yeah, we've just some coined call it, it AI right ops. Here. Some of them. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <clears throat> so let's trade so market and patent it. Exactly. Exactly. And then just wait for the virtual millions to roll in. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Don't so, start talking about Bitcoin. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> what about blockchain? <laughs> Bam! <laughs> sorry, sorry. <Beep. laughs> so, M- ML ops. What, what's what sort of what's ML ops about? What's the what's the core concept here? So, for ML ops, I would treat it in um, two categories. There is. Um, the traditional data science development lifecycle that we should take a look and uh, uh, try to apply the data ops and the DevOps uh, strategies and approaches to it. And there is also the integration of ML ops to so your everything that the data scientists have done, plus apply the your application software development. So all of your software engineers and your app dev DevOps people into it. So try to combine those two processes. So you have the traditional DevOps, the people that are typically developing an application. Typically, most machine learning models, they're either, if they're done, let's say, on a batch format, they're generated as a report, right? So it's an offline report. Maybe it could be as simple as an Excel file. It could be a database or something. But if you're really doing for something that's going to be more real time, it's typically tied in, into some sort of an application, whether it's a web app or a mobile app. You need to tie in those two aspects together. So uh, to me, MLOps, the second part of it is also uh, taking your uh, machine learning uh, development that you have as part of the that mini kind of a ecosystem and also tie it into your DevOps cycle as well. And data ops being in the middle of it as well. So f- the way I, I, I think of like, if uh, you look at data ops and ML ops there, if you put it in the Venn diagram, they're like essentially part of uh, the same bigger circle, essentially. And DevOps okay. and data ops with ML ops, they intersect. All of these yep. three intersect and make a, the three circle Venn diagram. Perfect. So, when we're talking about the these sort of these life cycles of machine learning, what what are we actually talking about? What what are the what are the different stages of the life cycle that we that we care about here? So, let's take a look at the uh, different uh, aspects of it. So, if we concentrate on the uh, the data science aspect of it. And just primarily from a data science perspective, uh, data scientist perspective or data analyst that you want to put it, there's typically for, um, several uh, cycles that you go. So you have data preparation, you have your experiment phase. This is where for, uh, you test out, uh, do statistical analysis of your data. Uh, at that point, you can uh, train and build a model uh, for that would. Uh, solve a particular business use case. Typically, the next kind of life cycle step is uh, creating and registering this model into some central repository. Uh, that could be like a file system, a GitHub, or for a Docker registry. Um, and <clears throat> you create uh, for an image out of it. And so this is where you actually get a chance to deploy it. And typically, if a lot of people use um, the Docker registries or some sort of container registries, and the last step is actually deploying and productionalizing this uh, model. So this is your deployment service. You have the model serving, and you also have uh, the model monitoring aspect to it. Okay. So as I mean, these all sound like kind of relatively um, sort of standard phases within the sort of the machine learning um, sort of process. So in terms of sort of operationalizing how how new is the the concept of of kind of making this more streamlined making it operationalized so i think the concepts are they've been around from the perspective that i defined they're there but actually um applying some of the software engineering principles like storing let's say the uh, you make sure that you store um, your source code, your configuration files, everything into source control. You have a continuous mm-hmm. integration CI, CD, C process that uh, typically that a lot of times uh, you have a data scientist that actually builds a model and says, okay, here's what I've developed. Go ahead and uh, for productionalize it for me. Um, mm-hmm. for I was actually for in a similar situation for six years ago, I was a research scientist uh, for at Independence Blue Cross, and my 
primary job was to actually operationalize and convert some of the SaaS models that they, uh, for the data scientists, were developing into something that could be consumed uh, by uh, an application report. So it was uh, predicting high-cost patients, essentially. And uh, I was supposed to take a SaaS model and convert it into open source. At the time, it was R and Python that I was looking at. This is even pre-Spark ML kind of days. Uh, and uh, yeah. deploy it. So <clears throat> those kind of challenges have been around there as well for a while. Uh, people would develop it. And typically at that point, what they've done previously is they exported, they were limited to very simple uh, models. So typically something that could be like a linear model that has a, uh, a, a formula that you could just apply with the coefficients. So that would that would have made it into a Java application. They provided here's the coefficients, here's the features they're using, and you have your uh, uh, formula that you want to apply. But that sort of made the restriction on what kind of models uh, the data scientists could actually use. So they ended up using you know, linear or logistic regression models uh, for, to make it easier for the application development. So anything that you wanted to make, like a neural net, that became a complex kind of a, uh, endeavor. And none of this have, uh, even at that time, thinking about actually putting up, uh, let's say, like a DevOps server, whether it's a Jenkins uh, or if, uh, any of the continuous integration server uh, has been around. So typically right now, what most of the people are trying to do is uh, uh, you give, you as a data scientist, you work on your favorite uh, IDE uh, or web notebook, you've integrated with the uh, uh, source control repository, and that typically is tied into your uh, continuous integration server like Jenkins that will trigger like a build of uh, will at that point part of the pipeline will register the model automatically into uh, container registry if it's a successful build and if, uh, if give you a version to it. The other side of it, if you feel when you have the software engineer or you want to call it uh, your DevOps person that container register would sort of be the intermediate for uh, integrating into it. So your software engineer that resides typically on a completely separate team, sometimes there could be part of the same team, they would actually consume and use that uh, model that got registered. And the beauty of uh, what a lot of uh, industry has been moving to into uh, Dockerized containers. So if you, once you actually create it and build your model, that's typically a Docker container that the uh, application developers know. And uh, this is sort of their uh, play length. Uh, for, I think Docker is pretty much like water right now to us. Yep. And I think this is one of the terms that I think you guys used <laughs> earlier in your podcast. Um, that makes it a lot easier for them to integrate. So it gives a, a continuous integration aspect from them. So typically they will have their own DevOps or Jenkins or another CIDC server that will actually in, integrate, consume the model, and then have uh, uh, for a deployment to uh, either UET or QA environment. And then you actually go through the process of validation. So from like dev to UAT environment. Yeah so, yeah, so basically by using the Docker environment, they don't have to care what the thing is doing on the inside. They just deal with the abstracted outside layer of the Docker environment and productionize a Docker container, whatever it may contain. That's exactly it. Yeah. So for Docker becomes sort of the intermediate and easy way for them to consume. And most of the tools that of, uh, we can take a look, they've... Uh, they uh, make it easy to serve up those models. So for the data scientist is concerned uh, primarily about uh, building the model, mm -hmm. and there is a whole bunch of uh, available tools that will make it easier for you to uh, integrate, and they will serve the model. So for the, what they'll do is typically they'll serve up either like a Flask server or uh, some sort of REST server or RPC server that allows you to consume these models. So yeah. with one line of code, it uh, it can deploy and make it containerize. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, the data scientist is sort of abstracted from a lot of these kind of uh, challenges that previously you had to do. So what are you right in saying that the aim of having <clears throat> MLOps, as we coined the phrase now, uh, is there to solve that old problem we used to have where the data scientist built a nice model and then somebody else had to rewrite it completely because productionizing models was 
pretty much impossible. They had a couple of intermediate languages that didn't really work very well. Now using the whole DevOps approach, using Docker containers, having CICD pipelines is actually possible. I mean, if I'm a, a, a user and consumer inside my organization of machine learning modules, are you actually saying, claiming, proving that I can just throw it in the build pipeline and it'll, it'll automatically update to the next model and it'll all work beautifully? Are we there yet? Uh, with the right uh, investments, we can be there. Okay. Uh, you still need to, it, just like uh, everything in DevOps, it's not all about technology. Mm -hmm. It's about bringing together the people, yep. processes, yep. and products to automate the delivery. So typically yep. DevOps is to automate software delivery. This is, we're extending a new aspect to it. So mm -hmm. we're uh, bringing in the data side to it, uh, stuff that we pretty much, you guys covered with uh, Christopher on the data apps. But for, this is also introducing also the machine learning aspects and heavily for concentrating on the uh, prediction. So this is where ML ops uh, uh, is going to be more concentrating on. Now, as remember, as I said, there's like the two categories that I look at is the one is just the pure the data science lifecycle that we haven't really mm -hmm. dived into. And that's uh, that life cycle involves more with the actual data science. So keeping up a journal, what I like to call as like a, a diary of our data scientists. What did I actually do on this day? I ran this kind of an experiment with these kind of parameters and I got this kind of a result. So there's the ML ops for the data scientists and there is the ML ops uh, that talks and loves the DevOps. So this is the two, the marriage of the DevOps and the ML ops. That's the previous one that I was sort of describing as yeah. the kind of end-to-end -end life cycle of integrating and using Docker for, as sort of the intermediate to serve up that. So realistically for ML ops is also, we got to talk about uh, the actual data scientist kind of challenges that they go through and some of the point, pain points that they cover. So okay. typically it's, a lot of times you will have maybe one data scientist, but in uh, bigger organizations, you'll have more than mm -hmm. uh, one data scientist and they could be working on the same kind of problem. Uh, the Which the term that is, that, that's been uh, for, coined by the software engineers, it worked on my machine, it applies to the data scientists, you know? And I think it's even harder for them because... Um, with the software engineers, we're pretty pretty good. We, we have, uh, I don't know, if you're coming from a Java or .NET or some other uh, language, you have, okay, you have an SDK that you need to match a particular version, and you have some packages that are typically, I would say, in Java is going to be controlled by a Maven, and they're controlled pretty easily. Some of these kind of concepts um, have been uh, carried over in the data science. So like in Python, we have the pip and we can control the Python packages that make it easier. But not everything is pip installable or conda installable. Some of like, like OpenCV, if, uh, it's not part mm -hmm. of the repo. Uh, it, that aspect becomes uh, much more complex. So for the build process and the scripts are typically not, uh, data scientists don't, don't bother too much with scripts, I've noticed. I've literally came from a client uh, yesterday, a uh, big international company, and they had a single data scientist uh, with a team of three other data engineers, and they're trying to come up with a model, and they're going through kind of uh, the earlier stages of this process. And the data scientist has no interest about the end-to-end -end pipeline. He literally does not care. Like I could see him, like his eyes glaring over as soon as I would be talking to the data engineers how to build this kind of end-to-end -end -end pipeline. He only cares like how do I make my uh, neural net run and how do I make my life easier. N not saying that that's the case, but a lot of times that seems to be the kind of situations that I've, I've occurred. Um, so when you talk, you always have to kind of uh, either try to find the person that will be the kind of responsible for that ML ops operation, and, uh, and not always is uh, on a data scientist. Uh, they. A lot of them come just purely from math or statistics background. They don't have uh, computer science or software engineering or information systems uh, background. Uh, the data scientist that I was talking, over, we'll keep it anonymized, he was he came from a medical background. He was, uh, I believe, a, a doctor that picked up on his own uh, deep learning books and started going and coding at it. You know, using R and for. 
obviously you cannot uh, expect a person like that to look at it. But as most of the time, if and you read through so many articles, yeah, the machine learning model has been built in a matter of days or weeks. But then it takes months or years or never actually yeah. does it actually make out to the production. And this, there is, a, for, and as a disclaimer, for uh, we said I work for Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is really looking kind of at this uh, uh, for, at this kind of a pipeline as a challenge, and they even coined their term AI engineer. You know, uh, for I would more argue it's maybe ML engineer, or for not only so AI to me always sort of a, has a connotation to <laughs> some of the deep learning. Yeah. Uh, but the, the idea is right. You got to have an engineer that is responsible for uh, end-to-end lifecycle, just like we have DevOps people for um, software engineering, for so, uh, product delivery. Same thing, we need to have a similar kind of a role. Okay. Now, all of this stuff, uh, especially on the uh, productionizing part, that's stuff that wasn't possible only a couple, of, uh, I'd say, a year ago, because all of the we're going to be talking more about the practical projects and the, the tools in, that you can use there. But all of that stuff is pretty new still, isn't it? This is not something that's been done for years, or it has been around, but nobody had interest in it. It's because it's been growing, because the whole big data and machine learning environments have become mature. That all of these. I'm not going to call it edge things, but more polish on top of things that allow you to build these pipelines that has become available recently. Or am I totally out of the loop here? No, no, you're for exactly it. Uh, for a lot of this started coming about part of the popularity of the machine learning and AI. So uh, there is a whole bunch of uh, custom machine learning platforms that started coming about. Um, we have like the Facebook FB Learner, Uber has a Michelangelo. If you're a Kubernetes user, you've probably heard of Kubeflow. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were Spark and you're familiar with Databricks, you have MLflow. And uh, the recent one that I've actually found out is Redis AI uh, that has a similar, <laughs> for, you can run it on top of Redis, something that I learned just wow. literally re- very recent. Uh, and they all try to do very kind of similar. They try to standardize the data prep and training and deploy loop uh, while you work on these platforms. Uh, okay. Some of them have like kind of limited implementation of the algorithms. Uh, for, some of them are proprietary, not open standards. Some of them are open standards and going for it, uh, like Kubeflow or MLflow. Uh, not too, I don't know too much about Redis AI, but this is something that I'm, plan on the uh, kind of researching and taking a look but they're all part of this and um, sort of some of the challenges have been like you they have been trying to address this if you remember uh, something called pmml uh a markup <laughs> language who doesn't um, have nightmares about pmml <laughs> Exactly. So I think that was the very first kind of uh, approach of uh, abstracting. Uh, so you build it in one tool and you can extract it and run it on whatever runtime of your choice. Now we have something coming up uh, on next, like the Open Neural Network Exchange, the, mm-hmm. which is like a common runtime for all different types of models. So you have the MX nuts, the scikit learns, the CNTKs, the PyTorches, the TensorFlow. They try... Uh, <laughs> The way that I had positioned Onyx, and the, when the first time I heard it, I'm like, oh, okay, PMLv2. <laughs> <I think, laughs> Ooh, some people oh, got really insulted <laughs> <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe they brought the negative connotation, but PML did have a place. And if, uh, even me for working five, six years ago at the Pedals Blue Cross, I remember for looking at PML for standardizing. So taking a SAS model, and like I'm thinking, there has to be a way. And there was a PML extraction that uh, give, generates a Java code, essentially a Java library that you can go and run. But the stuff that the data scientists were working on primarily were just like, okay, just a linear formula. I can hack it up, give me the coefficients, and I'll make it run in five minutes. You know, But that just limited to to very simple models. So the mm-hmm. complexity of the models was restricted. Yeah, we but, also had the uh, uh, project, uh, the Emily project come in uh, about a year, two years ago now. But we had Holland and Mikhail on, I think, in the first year of the podcast to talk about when they built uh, the Emily thing. And if I'm not mistaken, Databricks is now actually using Emily as their default serialization, serializer, let's say, for uh, machine learning models. 
You're absolutely correct. I'm Weep is uh, they're recommending it. I don't. I believe you're right. That's the standard. The problem is not every single model, at least like six months ago, four months ago, uh, that I checked, uh, have has been M Leap serializable. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. the beauty of it is obviously that you can take it, you build it on a big data platform, and you can extract it and then run it locally on your machine. You don't have to have a Spark cluster or something like that. So it is for one of those as well. So th there's a whole bunch of uh, solutions that are coming yeah. around that allows you to do this. So you're absolutely right. Sounds like a bonanza, a bit of a gold rush going on here. Uh, it makes it very hard for people who aren't dealing with this stuff every day of every week to figure out, okay, if I'm going to start doing this, which one should I pick now if a company like Databricks <laughs> is behind something like MLflow and something like Microsoft is behind Azure ML and, oh God, how, how do you choose be between these things? Are there any guidelines, any... Any is there a big competition going on, or people working together and making something more beautiful? What's your view on the situation today? So purely my speculation, not representing mm -hmm. of Microsoft or or Databricks or anybody else or if, uh, <laughs> Kubernetes. Uh, I'll give you sort of what I, what I'm seeing uh, and the way that I picture the landscape. A lot of it depends on what you're currently using. So if you're let's say a Kubernetes user right now you're probably going to be looking at something like Kubeflow yeah. to get started. But Kubeflow, as of uh, the latest version that I saw, uh, does not have a good tracking server. Um, so the tracking server is something that is uh, allows a data scientist to uh, track the experiments. So it's that uh, diary slash journal that I was mentioning. It's so like, what did I actually... Uh, what's the model that I ran? What are the input parameters? What was my results? What were the metrics that I got? So what was my root mean square error for R square? It gives you like essentially a journal to it. And I've seen, uh, including let's say like Kubeflow being used with the product called MLflow that I think provides a very good open source uh, uh, tracking server. Okay. Now, if you were not in the Kubernetes land and uh, you, were, you, you haven't made that kind of a transition, uh, you have other solutions like MLflow that is uh, comes uh, out of Databricks uh, and is heavily supported by Databricks. Microsoft is uh, one of the uh, contributors as well and is heavily adapting MLflow as the API. MLflow behind the scenes is uh, a combination of s uh, several components. Uh, it has uh, a tracking server uh, that I've mentioned earlier. It has uh, MLflow projects and MLflow models. Um, the projects and models is what's responsible for packaging and uh, packaging the format and having uh, reproducible runs on any platform. It could be a local or it could be a Dockerized. And MLflow models is, defines the specific model format that you can deploy with. So uh, if you what I like about MLflow is that you can run it on your machine. You don't need to have uh, a Spark okay. cluster or you don't need to have uh, be on a cloud. It's completely agnostic. You can run it on your laptop. You can run it as an IS. There is managed services that comes from Databricks, uh, the, mm -hmm. from other platforms, and it integrates a lot uh, with other uh, services as well. So with AWS SageMaker, you can connect and deploy to it. You can connect to Azure AML services and deploy and run. So they they try to for provide different components. Uh, and at the same time, they allow you to use these different components individually based on your needs. Uh, what I like to think is that it's not, no one tool is going to provide you everything. You have to look at it from... What do you actually have right now? Uh, what are you using? What are your um, data scientists, your software engineers? What kind of environment? And start looking from that perspective. But I think the the more too uh, popular is uh, probably going to be Kubeflow and the MLflow that I'm seeing right now. Uh, there is other commercially ones is available as well. Um, that uh, you can, uh, for, I'm more concentrating kind of an open source. So uh, mm -hmm. probably those are the two primary ones that I'm uh, primarily interested in right now. Uh, but uh, there's uh, other commercially viable ones that you can have the paid for. 
as well. But what you you mentioned, apparently, it sounds like they actually integrate quite well. That it's not a, a big uh, hoop to jump through if you want to use both for different parts of what you're doing uh, using the uh, model tracking of ML Flow with uh, the Cube uh, Flow thing. That that does seem to be intentional. How they built the thing, or do you do a lot of, have to do a lot of uh, hacking around to make it actually work nicely together? No, but it actually is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So if you actually get a chance, uh, and this is for the audience, if, uh, if, uh, take a look on the Spark Summit. There is, I believe, a presentation by Comcast, and they have uh, Kubeflow with MLflow. And they uh, specifically, just for that reason, they were using uh, Kubeflow was missing the tracking server aspect, and they spun up a tracking server uh, behind the scenes. The, MLflow is very easy. You do a pip install MLflow, and it gives you uh, uh, libraries that allow you to run both from Python, from R, from uh, different languages. So there, there is essentially a REST server and a whole bunch of client libraries. Mm -hmm. But uh, you start it very easily. You say mlflow.start run, or initially you, you create an experiment. So this is your high level uh, experiment that you're running. So let's say uh, my experiment name is. Uh, Hot dog, not hot dog. Uh, for, <laughs> for people who know. <laughs> uh, for the people that know the HBO show, not Silicon Valley. Uh, that's your experiment name. And then you start, okay, if uh, mlflow.start run, and you give it a run name, and I'm going to call it run one, uh, Jan and Dave. And within it, uh, you start doing, let's say you created a random four, so let's... Uh, Whatever the algorithm that you want, you say, okay, I'm going to lock some parameters. So I'll have my parameters like alpha. Uh, I will lock the metrics that I got out of the model once I validate it. So I'm going to lock a metric like MSC. I will lock some artifacts like a plot. And I can also at the same time do ML flow and log model and specify the model. What that's going to do, it's going to uh, serialize it. So if it's going to be, let's say, like a psych learn model, it's going to be a pickle. If it's TensorFlow, it's going to serialize it in the appropriate format and mm -hmm. going to log it onto that tracking server. Now, that's just the, like for creating, a, think of it as an artifact repository. Uh, there is uh, <clears throat> there's the other aspect of the serving server, but this, you're just abstracting ML flow by the tracking server and then Kubeflow can still do the serving and everything else. But that just gives you sort of the, the diary that you wanted to do. Yeah, when you're talking about this artifact repository, that's uh, that's the MLflow service that's running behind the scenes. Uh, if I'm right in what I read here, uh, that's a bit like, I don't know, like like, like having a, a GitHub server behind the scenes that captures all of the stuff you're doing, all the logs, the artifacts you generated, the, the serialized images, and has them centrally located so you can actually do things like revision control, compare and contrast and things like that. That's exactly it. So there's really two kind of uh, components for storage. There's a backend store and an artifact store uh, within the MLflow. So the backend store is where it stores the experiments and run metadata types. So those are like your parameters, metrics, tags. And there is two types of backend stores that you can have. You can have either a file store or a database backed store. The artifact store, which is the second type of store, uh, it's suitable for the larger data objects. So that's going to be uh, for where you log your artifact outputs. So let's say like your models, the pickle models, those are typically bigger. And typically you, you can do it as a blob, as an S3 bucket, or mm -hmm. an, an NFS file system. Mm -hmm. So those are the primary for kind of storage that you have for those. Yeah. Uh, would you also be capturing your test and training data sets, for instance? For test and the actual data sets, you wouldn't. So typically, they would reside on external. So I mean, they, they could be backed by, let's say, uh, for a blob or for Azure Data Lake Storage or S3 or your file okay. system. So this is where it would actually reside. Um, within MLflow, if you use the Databricks and you use Delta, they actually uh, have something called the uh, timeline machine where you can actually track your experiment to a particular snapshot of your data. So, okay. and that's only if you've, uh, I guess, using the Delta. So that feature actually makes it very kind of interesting because you can 
a snapshot, your experiment to a particular version of data, which I think is critical. Uh, a lot of times when you do it is you get a snapshot, typically what the, the life cycle of a data scientist is, you get a, a snapshot of data that you're yeah, going to yeah, be yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, working yeah. and interacting on at one time frame. But then you go in and you need to come back to do that experiment two months later. That data set is usually not of, uh, on exactly. your drive yeah, or yeah. it's too huge. Should be. Uh, either that blob is gone or if, uh, <laughs> you need to re rerun this. And a lot of times when you rerun it, the original source data has changed. I have came across that uh, when I was working at Independence Blue Cross and building these models. I'm like, I'm like well, I was about to curse, but <laughs> uh, it was like, but where's my data? You know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. what happened to it? The, 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 my model, my model results are not what they used to be. There is a data drift that's happening. You know, so for to be able to at least see and to be able to produce that kind of uh, snapshotting is very, uh, very powerful. Yes, actually, a uh, no, totally uh, side point here, but we talked about Delta a couple of episodes ago, and we really couldn't find a reason why it would exist. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> adding your data sets to this uh, ML flow repository would make it very, very big and unwieldy. Having snapshot of ability, yeah, I can actually understand why uh, <laughs> how these things fit together now. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. I mean, the, the, there's a whole... Uh, uh, Delta is just the future, and I'm ver very glad that they open sourced it. I'm very surprised that that wasn't original, but uh -huh. obviously, Databricks got a lot of pushback from the community, and people were probably saying, "No, we're not going to use this until this is, <laughs> becomes a standard." Yeah. Um, so, mean open source for, has no force. <laughs> correct. Uh, there is a lot of good things behind it that it optimizes okay. uh, for your. The small problem, the small file problem. Uh, for yep. If you haven't come across the, this on the Hadoop land, the, it is extremely challenging and painful to have uh, lots of small files. And if you have uh, millions of small files, your job will sit and wait for sometimes hours before it kicks off and do anything because it's trying to do a read of all of these files. So. Delta a lot of, uh, optimizes. You can vacuum in and data automatically behind the scenes will merge them in. So there is definitely a place for Delta, I think. Okay. Now, we've been you talked We're about... We're digressing. Uh, We're digressing. Uh, uh, which we never do on this podcast, ever. <laughs> right, Dave? No, I've, I've, never, I've never seen us deviate one, one, one second from what we mean to be talking about. So what were you talking about? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Okay, you've talked about a lot of stuff, Alex. Uh, let's say I want to start doing this. This is this is great. I want to do data flow, data ops, whatever you want to call this. Um, how do I start? Do I send my one or a dozen data scientists off to a retreat in Hawaii for two weeks to make them grok the whole data flow, data ops uh, methodologies? Uh, do I have to set an entire <laughs> I new... Send, I think you should send me to Hawaii for two weeks. That sounds like an excellent plan. We tried that last time I you think, came I back. I think I'm uh, going to no. join Dave. <laughs> I'm going to join Dave and we're going to have... We're going to set up a whole <laughs> conference there. Yeah. In fact, yeah, I think we should great. make it a month. I think it requires a month <laughs> worth of... Uh... Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Alex, you've, you've got the right idea entirely. Yeah. Good luck getting that much time off from your bosses, right? <laughs> I think that should True. be an approved True. expense. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a work trip. Uh, I'll sign your slip a it's few a pages trip, if you sign mine, work. okay? Uh, but uh, seriously, uh, I mean, you, you talked about having this uh, services running, so you do need to have some kind of infrastructure in place. Uh, there's a REST API. You've, you've already mentioned a couple of, uh, let's call it function calls that you would use in your script or notebook, I guess. So how far, how big a step is it for people to tell the data scientists, hey, per person, data scientist, smart person, we're going to start doing it the right way now. And we decided this is how to do it. And you have to now do this. How much, I mean, change is always it's something people are afraid of. I'm, it's valid for me, valid for everybody, I'm assuming. How big of a step is this? How, how scared should a data scientist be? And how scared should a data scientist's boss be to try and push this out? So for, and we're going to, once again, step back, we're talking, let's say, let's talk about the diary or the journal from the data science perspective. Mm -hmm. What I've described is literally about three to four lines of code uh, to just create uh, an experiment, create uh, for, uh, and start a run. And then it's just some lock statements. So for 
if the data scientist data analysis are already used to having print statements, this is no different. Re remove the print statement and put, put in the ML flow dot log something, and that will start logging uh, your experiments. Uh, the beautiful thing is that uh, if if it becomes more kind of a enterprise grade uh, service, they'll be able to set up. Uh, a real tracking server that can be utilized by the whole enterprise and collect from all of the data scientists. It could be as easy as I set up AmoFlow on my machine, or I could point it to a remote server. So if the enterprise decides to, or the team decides to have a hosted server, they, they just add one more line, AmoFlow set tracking URI and point to it. And the beauty is, let's say for a little bit kind of a spin for the Microsoft uh, Azure ML services, uh, you can say uh, MLflow dot set tracking URI and pass in your AML workspace URI that automatically comes from your AML SDK. So literally, your uh, all of the logs and everything that you do gets sent out to the uh, Azure Machine Learning service. And there is an experiments tab and there is a run tab, very similar to what it's doing. In fact, those two, I feel those two products are getting much, much more closer to it. But it's the same thing. Uh, if, uh, SageMaker has a similar, like a managed solution where you can deploy the services out to. Now, what I just said is primarily only on the tracking server. Uh, once you actually do some of this and you are actually able to uh, log this and log the model, you can easily, from a DevOps or even including your data scientists, can easily serve up this um, this model with a simple command like MLflow. There's a there's an uh, SDK and there's also a command line, a CLI. You can say MLflow space by function serve and point it to the path of your model where you stored and provide a port number. What it's gonna do behind the scenes is gonna spin up a, a Flask uh, server. And it's going to expose your model with the rest endpoint that can serve predictions. So literally for the data scientist, it's an additional line of code that he can now then start integrating with your software engineers. And they can either push it as already uh, make a whole build and push it out to uh, the container registry, make a Docker image. But it could be even integrated even at an earlier point where then... You serve it up and uh, you can get the application consuming from it or the data scientists can see what is actually going to be happening. So there's kind of a lot of uh, accelerations and similar things are available in Kubeflow as well. So mm -hmm. they're able to kick off. I think there's even more kind of a bigger push from Kubeflow from a uh, CI CD perspective as well. Everything is driven. They try the way they try to do it is they have everything you don't. You never leave your notebook, and you integrate everything to it. So both projects are trying to do uh, similar kind of uh, tasks. I'm more familiar with MLflow. Uh, Kubeflow is kind of my uh, more uh, well, want to research it a lot more. I'm, I'm impressed with both solutions at this point. And welcome back. This was the first part of the interview we did with Alex on ML flow and all things model management. Um, we This uh, first part was more or less on a theoretical level, let's say, more about the whys and hows and how good it could be. In the second part, which will be coming out, not next episode, because that's a news episode, but the one after that, that will be episode 147, uh, we'll be going to a bit more practicalities, a bit more how you actually do these things, what the uh, uh, possible pitfalls may be, and Alex mm -hmm. will also give us all of his, uh, how do you call that, advice, uh, how you can best wisdom. approach this wisdom. Well, there was already a lot of wisdom in this one, so <laughs> it will be a continuation of wisdom, let's say. Yep. I love uh, continued wisdom. It's my favorite kind of wisdom. <laughs> but thanks a lot to Alex for spending time with us. And he'll be back in a couple of weeks. So unless you have anything else to add. That's it for me. Then that's all the time you have for today. You can support this podcast by becoming a patron. Every contribution helps. Please go to www.roaringalpha.org. Find the link there to our Patreon page. You can find more information there on the podcast. You can find the contact form. You can use us, you can use Twitter to find me, mostly, uh, using the at Hadoopcast tag. And you can send feedback to podcast at roaringelephant.org. 
Uh, anything else I forgot? Yes, we've got a YouTube page out there as well. We're still trying to reach our 100 subscriber uh, target there so we can claim our name to fame. So go to YouTube, please find us there. There's a link on our homepage. Subscribe, like, whatever. There's a third thing, which I always forget. Hit the notification bell. Yes. No, you don't. <laughs> but anyway, until next time, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you there.